it's fun to be with you. It's fun to share the stories, situations, problems, successes of people who are practicing unconditional love in the world. It's a small number of people. So it's encouraging to all of us that it can be done, that there are people who are actually living this way. And to hear that there are unconditionally loving answers to conundrums that otherwise would just bury us, which we've proven on uncounted occasions. This first writer is a supervisor at a workplace. And she says, today was more challenging. I made some people work hard. I got pulled aside by the old acting manager, and I was told that I was irritating everybody. <laughs> the question unavoidably comes to my mind, why is the old acting manager even there? <laughs> What's he doing? Uh, you, do you report to him in any way? I later learned that no, she didn't. Uh, so tell him, really nice to see you and go away. Um, of course he would be somewhat critical of what you're doing because there's no way that you would be doing it the way he did it. Uh, and he would take that, he would either have to say, you're wrong or discredit you in some way uh, or adapt his beliefs and behaviors to yours. Yeah, not likely to do that. So it's pretty likely that the old manager would disagree with you. And so if possible, goodbye. Um, here's a can of nuts and you can go on your way. Second, there is no way to improve an organization without annoying people. There isn't. The way an organization is running is partly a function of the policies of the organization, but it's also very often a function of the way people want to do things. They modify the rules in their head. You, you hear this every day. You give somebody an instruction, no kidding, this clear. I want you to put these cans on the second shelf. Second shelf high, second shelf from the floor. You come back there on the fourth shelf. You mention it to them and they say, well, I thought there was no lack of clarity. People really often hear what they want to hear. Um, so you're going to annoy some people because they have to adapt. And most people don't like adapting. They don't like changing. And the more irritated they are, the more likely they are not to fit in, as in ever. Now, it's worth trying for sure, but very likely those people, you're the manager who resists you the most. You really save a lot of time by just observing them for a while and then just letting them go pursue a job that is more congruent with what they do, which in many cases is sit back and do nothing. Take a perpetual lunch break. You can't afford the poison of such people being annoyed. I've read stacks of business management books that go from the floor to the ceiling. I'm not exaggerating. And one of the lessons that was repeated over and over by successful CEOs is assess people's willingness to learn and to adapt to the corporate environment earlier. And if they don't, let them go earlier recognizing that perhaps you made a mistake in hiring. Uh, perhaps you made a, a mistake in your original assessment of them, but they're going to bring your organization down. You continue, I explained that people are happy when they work hard. I assume you're explaining this to the old boss and that stretching and growing sometimes hurts. Uh, he couldn't hear me. Yeah, you were speaking to the old boss. He said, things worked like a smoothly oiled machine before. Well, <laughs> I can remember when you started the job and <laughs> it, 
it may have been smoothly oiled, but it was missing a number of parts. It doesn't matter how much oil you pour on something that's been badly constructed. Uh, and it indicates that very likely he was too reluctant. That's a, that's a kind version of lazy and afraid to make people work. Most people give people, give most people a choice. Nine out of 10 people will choose to work less than more. So bosses come along and people are working less. And if they tell them to work more, when does anybody ever say when they hear you're doing it wrong or you need to work harder? When does anybody ever say, oh, thank you. I needed to hear that. <laughs> it's rare. And so bosses tend not to speak. So what he meant by oiled was he didn't have to do anything. He stood by as a suboptimal performance, as you have described to me before, um, continued. It was good enough for him. That's what he means by well-oiled. Remember this, because as a manager, it is never possible to please everyone, really. If I'm not getting fairly regular complaints from somebody about something I said or did, then I'm not loving and teaching enough. Certainly not teaching enough. You continue. I was thinking about it afterward, and his smoothly oiled machinery involved four people standing in a shed, smoking for an hour, waiting to do the work of one person while there was other essential stuff that needed doing. Exactly what I was saying. That's his definition of well-oiled. Foolish. And that's why your organization was having financial difficulties. They were paying people not to work, which sort of, by the way, is why they hired you. Uh, so that the organization would work better. If it was working optimally, why did he leave? Uh, he wasn't at retirement age. You continue. He was moaning on behalf of other people. This, that's called vicarious victimhood. And I told him to mind his own business and leave them to talk to me. If he had a problem with his work, uh, to talk to me. And if not, get on with it. Uh, so apparently he's there in some capacity. That part's confusing to me. I interrupted his overlong lunch break uh, as a job that, with a job that needed doing right then and there. And he was furious. So apparently the ex-boss is the still being employed, but was deemed not to, to be doing a good job as a manager. There's almost no way to keep an employee like that. They were in a supervisory position. Uh, the owners of the place uh, demoted them from a supervisory position to a working position, and now they're being um, supervised by somebody else. They don't like giving up that power. They cost more. They poison the morale of everybody. Um, I would suggest that you begin the paperwork to eliminate that employee if the employee is consistently resistant. It is the loving thing to do. No kidding. For everybody involved with the business. Because if you keep somebody who's not doing their job, you make the, the work harder for everybody else who's there. And that's just not fair. Next uh, subject. Daily, minute by minute, says this writer, I feel this overwhelming need for air. Like I can't breathe. When I reach out, I get nothing. That's a lot of pain, honey. You continue, I wasn't locked in a cage as a child, although I did have four fathers and my mother was married seven times. Uh, it's what I saw, heard, and wasn't given. Being raped by my friend's father at age 10 pretty much sealed the deal. All of those experiences were variations on, I don't love you and you're worthless. And that would be pretty awful for a kid. No kid could put all that together. Being abused, 
emotionally, physically, however, in the end, doesn't really matter, you, you would just feel not worthwhile. I'm trying to read the PTSD book. I am struggling big time. I'm too old. I'm too hurt. I'm too scared. Well, I don't blame you. You're carrying around the accumulated pain. You say you're too old. The accumulated pain of many decades. It's, a, it's become a mountain sitting on top of your head. Facing what is really going on in your life would be very painful, unavoidably so. You say it was never, ever, ever my desire to be born into my parents' life, and I feel hurt. Yeah, I get it. That makes sense. You're going to need a lot of healing. You say, I'm reading in your book, when someone is genuinely, quote, when someone is genuinely, unconditionally concerned about our happiness, we feel connected to that person, end quote. You say, I don't feel anything. I don't feel anything at all except the urge to run away. More proof of your pain and fear. You say, there's just too much pain. I did not mean to hurt my own children either. Never, ever did. Of course you didn't. Neither did your parents, who were similarly crippled. Children don't care about that. No child looks at an abusive parent and says, I understand you're just, you know, in a lot of pain from your childhood. You didn't mean to hurt your children, but hurting them was unavoidable because you didn't receive the love you needed in order to love them. You say, when I love them, when I say I love them, I do like no other love in this world. It might be more accurate to say, you love them as well as you can. But you can't give what you didn't get yourself. So there's no way that you could, in the pain you're describing, you, you feel like you're reaching out for air all the time. There's no way that you could be unconditionally loving your kids. It's just not possible. You continue, I would have and still would, as their mother, take my last breath and be there for them and Give them my breath so they could live. I believe you. Um, in fact, it's fairly well documented. I've had people who worked in the military, uh, in other organizations where like, firefighters, where sometimes extraordinary courage is required. And these men who have earned medals of valor for just extraordinary courage would go out and save a companion in the middle of a firefight and drag them back. And they say, they've said to me, it was like a reflex. I didn't even think when I did it. And you'll hear that a lot from people who do heroic acts. And they say, loving my children is far more difficult. Because see, your companion is dying on the battlefield and you have the bodily strength, you have a rush of adrenaline, you know it needs to be done. It's like a job that needs to be done. And yes, you do feel some connection to the man who's out there wounded on the battlefield, but there's an entire book uh, called War by, I think, Sebastian Junger. And he's interviewed a bunch of uh, heroes. And he says the most common motivator for people running out on the battlefield is not courage. They're not thinking at all. It's Fear. Fear of what their companions would say if they didn't go out and save the guy in the battlefield. Day-to-day -day unconditional love is what your children needed. And you just weren't in a position to do that. No blaming. No guilt. This situation is true for most parents. We all wanted so badly to unconditionally love our children. Better then we were loved. But what tools did we have? We just didn't know how. New subject. The other day, my grandson, Bruce, was um, saying family prayers at night. And he said, help us to find new ways 
to be kind. I'm pretty sure at age, let's see, six, I think he is. I'm pretty sure at age six, I never said those words. <laughs> Help us to find new ways to be kind. I'm not sure I knew what kind was. The next morning, Bonnie, uh, who is four, climbs into her older sister Sylvie's bed. Sylvie was is seven. And she snuggles up to her and whispers in her ear, I appreciate you. <laughs> I'm having a really hard time picturing a four-year-old do this to a seven-year-old. But it happened. And she kept saying it over and over until her sister woke up and wrapped her arms around her. This did not happen in my family of origin. <laughs> and didn't happen in virtually any family of origin that I've ever come across. It's a beautiful thing to hear, though. So my parents didn't know how to do that with me. I learned how to do that with my children, but only after years of not loving them. So they were already injured by that time. My children are doing that with their children, and their children are doing that with each other. Yeah, that that's good enough for me. Uh, I, I can't go back and change the way I behave toward people, but seeing the effects of what I've learned continue from generation to generation, that's pretty satisfying. New subject, a woman, Paulette, learning to practice uh, real love, a people pleaser. She takes care of everybody in the family. Transportation, birthday parties, Christmas, name it, everything. She set up the birthday party for her daughter-in-law, Jill, uh, on her birthday. Meaning the birthday of Jill, the daughter-in-law. But then Jill decided that she'd rather have it on another day because it conflicted with some itty bitty little tiny thing that she had planned. Maybe I can't remember what it was. Uh, go to a sale at a going out of business thing for a fabric shop. I don't know something, but that date then created a conflict for Paulette who was arranging the birthday party and everybody agreed that she would. Um, so that conflicted with, what Paulette had volunteered to do. She'd already put plans in place for the birthday party. She already put those into motion. And at my considerable encouragement, Paulette kept the birthday party on the birthday because everybody had agreed to that. Paulette had done considerable work to, to arrange the birthday party. And then at the last minute, the Birthday girl goes, well, I, I, I do have a fill in the blank, a bowling league to go to that night, a, whatever, something she could have, she knew about and could have mentioned from the beginning. And so she told Jill, her daughter-in-law, uh, that the birthday party was going to happen. Everybody was going to come. Everybody was going to have fun. Everybody would celebrate Paulette's birthday, but Paulette could come or not. There are very few people who would have the courage to do this. <laughs> Paulette writes, My son, who's the husband to uh, Jill, the birthday girl, uh, called to convince me to have his wife's birthday on another day, which is, of course, what she wanted. Of course he called you because she made him. You, you think he cares what day it's on? He doesn't care. But... He knew that she was going to make his life hell if she if he didn't call Paulette. Um, keep in mind, she can celebrate her own birthday any day she wants. Really, she can have her own party any time she wants. You, Paulette, are simply offering a birthday party on a certain date, May 3rd. I don't remember if that was the day. And... Paulette wants to do it on May 5th. Well, now there are two birthday parties for Paulette. One she doesn't attend and one she does. Who is injured? Nobody is hurt. 
Paulette can do anything she wants to except change you. And you would probably gladly change things except you had already made plans and people had made promises and now you'd have to go all undo all that. We think that if people fervently request something, which really means demand, we should comply. We really do. That's kind of really how the world runs. You're just making a kind offer. You're not conducting a negotiation. You've offered a gift and now she wants to modify it. Now, imagine this with a Christmas gift. You give somebody a Christmas gift um, and they say, thanks, but I want you to take it back and get this instead. Who, who would say that? It would be, it, it's one of the social norms that would be considered violated by saying that. Now, I do know some people who would say that, but we're going to ignore them. It would be absurd to modify a gift that's, give, that's being given to you. And yet that's what you're offering her as a gift. And she's saying, I want to change it. She's used to controlling everything and everybody, including you. And you let her for many years. Now you're changing things and including your son, her husband. She can hardly imagine that you're considering not doing what she wants. She must be just shaking her head because when she gets angry, the, everybody scatters. And there are lots of people like that. Victims scream, moan, complain, blow up, whatever it is, and they get what they want, which does what? It encourages them to continue to be victims. You continue. I told my son that being manipulated by Jill is just tiring because she does this all the time. There's a family party or meal with 16 people and she decides she wants to change the hour that the meal starts 30 minutes, but you know, before it's going to begin, which is pretty tough. I'm, I'm not known for my culinary skills, but I understand that getting everything on the table at a certain time requires a certain amount of coordination. So if you put it off for a half an hour, instead of getting broccoli, you get green mush. Um, she does this kind of change all the time. And it's tiring. So I decided not to do it anymore. She gets aggressive and even abusive. And I put up with it for years, but not anymore. I'm tired of tiptoeing around her. My son said, well, mom, I can't guarantee that she will come to the birthday party you're putting on for her. My response, so what? Then let her not come. Tell him that she has by pick a time and a date, th three o'clock Friday, whatever, to accept wholeheartedly the party at the time that it's scheduled, or you can go two ways. You can have the party without her, which then just turns it into a little family dinner uh, or whatever, or you don't have the party. You cancel everything instead of changing things. She really has to learn that she can't control everybody, but don't say that. If you, if you say, well, you just got to get over try, trying to control everything, you, that's a guaranteed fight, as opposed to I'm offering you this gift, so on Friday at three o'clock, you can notify me that you'd like to accept the gift or you'd like to have the gift returned. See, easy choice A, choice B. Make things very simple when somebody's angry or a victim. If you give them a lecture of any kind, or if you explain yourself like, mm, I'm tired of accommodating myself to your last minute demands, you're dead. They're not gonna hear anything. Simple choices. You continue. Then I also told him that if they do end up coming and she has an attitude about it, which is really likely, I will actually take her aside and tell her that she needs to stop the attitude because I won't have it in my house. Not anymore. I have in the past. I was wrong. I allowed it to occur, but I won't anymore. 
well, he became afraid that I would even think of doing such a thing because he wouldn't dare stop her from doing anything. That's how long she's been controlling him. Well, good for you. That's called being a person instead of a slave. So get this overall picture. You're being told you have to modify the gift you're freely giving. That's insane. And if she comes and she has an attitude, you're being told that you have to endure poison in your house. I would no more endure somebody having an attitude in my house than I would having somebody smoke in my house. Um, I don't care if people smoke, by the way. None. Have no judgment about it. But not here. I don't care if people have attitudes and poison people everywhere that they go. But not here. Here, I, I actually get to choose to tell them, A or B, change your attitude or leave. And I wouldn't be mad about it. Because if they take their attitude with them, oh, what a relief. You continue. My son actually opened up and talked about how emptied Jill and her, her whole family were. He said he truly has tried to teach her about real love, but she's just not getting it. Gee, no kidding. She doesn't want to get it. It would mean her not controlling everybody, which is the only way she's ever known how to live. That's really not her fault. She learned it as a child. She's just continuing as an adult. And it's not your problem to change. It's her problem and it's his problem as her partner. But you do get to refuse to be controlled by a controlling victim. You do. You don't get to change them, but you get to make whatever choices you wish to make. You conclude, he told me that Jill was having trouble with her family. No kidding. She would have trouble with everybody because she would do this demanding thing everywhere she goes. Um, really weak people pleasers would give in to her. But then eventually they get tired of it too. And what the people pleasers would tend to do is just sort of slink off and disappear. Other people would eventually get angry at her. And you continue. He suggested that she talk to you, meaning that Jill talked to me. <laughs> That's not very likely. And he told me that she did talk to you. He said it helped for a bit, but didn't do anything more with it after that. I was very encouraged that she even made the call to you. It turns out that I, I keep notes on uh, people who call initially. I don't when I know people. So if you're listening to this and I know you well, I don't take notes during our calls. But if I'm meeting somebody for the first time on Skype or by phone after the call, I jot down a few notes just because the next time they call, it's at least nice not to say, well, it's nice to meet you <laughs> when you've had six phone calls with them. <laughs> Otherwise, I promise you I would. <laughs> so she never talked to me and she has to lie about it to get him to back off because he's pushing her to do it. So she, she gets her way everywhere with intimidation, with guilt, with crying, with victimhood, with lying, with, you know, pretty much all the behaviors that we all use to protect ourselves. She's not a bad person. It's not her fault. She was trained to do this, but we don't have to play the game like ever. It's her game. She gets to play it, but we don't have to play with her. New subject. I know a woman in a miserable relationship. That's, by the way, not all that hard to find. She asked for some time to talk to me, so I gave her a day and a time. She didn't show up on the call. That's not all that rare. She didn't show up at all. Um, and I looked for her. I think it must have been a Skype call. I looked for her to call for some time, and then I emailed and I said that I was sorry that I missed her. And she responded that she got busy chatting with a friend and missed our call. That's a lot of information. 
So she's in a miserable relationship, said that she barely even wants to live, but chatting with a friend was more important. She wouldn't miss her appointment for chemotherapy. Let's put it that way. She wouldn't. She wouldn't miss her cruise. Um, boats on cruises leave exactly at the time they say they're going to leave the wharf. That I'm not kidding. Within five seconds, you can feel the ship quiver. It moves. I responded, I have a busier schedule than you could imagine. I Probably by email. Uh, I gave you the one time that I had left today, which meant that somebody else didn't get that time. So I had turned somebody else down because it was the only time left. Then you said you couldn't make it because you were chatting with someone, which means that your commitment to showing up when you said you would is pretty minimal. Makes me reconsider your commitment to learning, certainly whether you value my time. Notice to everybody who's listening, there's no anger in this. Just a commitment to myself to use my own time wisely. Much like I was encouraging uh, the woman who was doing the birthday party um, to use her time wisely and to value her time and to not throw it away or to give in to demands for more time. And I'm the only person who gets to determine how to use my time. Really? Nobody else gets to tell me what to do with my time. She responded, I feel a bit shocked that you said that, but only because in all caps, she said, nobody has ever said that to me. Therefore, I've never learned to be grateful for other people's time. Now, there's a ton in there, if you missed it. And I'm just going to pick out one little thing. Nobody's ever said that to her. Victims are make up such great excuses. They feel so entitled. They're so convincing that nobody has the courage to say anything to them. And they also know that if they did, the victim would erupt all over them. And really, nobody likes molten lava poured across their face. So... In all of her life, nobody's ever mentioned to her that she was inconsiderate in this way. She said, you're right. I didn't think at all about you or your schedule and the other people who have asked to speak to you. And I know there are loads. She said, seriously, thanks for putting it so black and white. I needed to hear that. This is not the usual response of, of a victim. This is really rare. She continues, sorry for wasting your time today. I also wasted a lecturer's time at university today, but was completely oblivious to it until I thought about it just now. I know you only told me this for the benefit of my own happiness and my own growth. I think I need to do some work on my own sense of entitlement. And now we'll see if she learns. The fact that she says she would like to learn or she needs to learn doesn't really mean anything. We'll just see. Most people are inconsiderate of other people's time. They don't hesitate to be late. They don't hesitate to demand other people's time. They don't hesitate to ask people to do things for them. They, they really don't think about other people. But nobody ever tells them because one they too don't care about anybody's time but their own, so it seems normal. And two, they're afraid of offending the inconsiderate person. So nobody ever says anything to anybody. That's not much of an exaggeration when I say nobody, because think about it. This lady who was, I can't remember, 50 years old, in her entire life had never had anybody say she was inconsiderate about other people's time, ever. So what are the odds that I picked the only victim who's inconsiderate of other people's time who had never been confronted about it? Pfft, ridiculous. So nobody says anything, and the selfish habit just perpetuates from year to year, from person to person, from generation to generation until it becomes normal. And once this pattern becomes 
normal, oh, well, we're done. New subject. I know a woman who's had a lot of pain in her childhood, more than average. She's also unusually sensitive and tender. So that amount of pain caused more harm than with most people. There, there are some people who are just unusually sensitive. So the same, tr for example, um, when a 20 year old falls down, running, they fall down, what happens? Well, they scrape their hands and they go ow and that's usually pretty much it. When a 93 year old falls down, um, hips break, um, all kinds of things happen. Whether due to age, whether due to past trauma in childhood or whenever, some people are more sensitive than others. And I spent some time with her. She said, thanks so much for helping me. Wow, do I want to feel free. My head is such a trap. I can really see just how the life, uh, sense of freedom and fun were crushed out of me. So I retreated up into my head. Of course you did. Now you're sensing freedom, which is a prerequisite to joy. It amounts to getting out of the prison of your head. We are all free to choose freedom and life or prison and death. The choice is that stark. It's that black and white. She said, I felt freer a month ago. Now I feel less free. Can you explain why? Mm. I know you and the audience needs to know that or, or I probably wouldn't be able to answer a question. You're just living deeper. So the freer and safer you feel, the safer you feel to let deep wounds surface. So at times you feel less free because the wounds are all around you, but they're just deeper wounds that you had to get to. Now we're going deeper and learning still to be free, like swimming. So at first you feel free to swim on the surface of the water in calm water, like a swimming pool. That's where most people learn to swim. Then as you get stronger, you feel free to swim where there are waves, like in a lake or the ocean, which is harder. Did you know how to swim before? Yes, before you went into the ocean. But now you're stronger because with the safety of swimming in calm, now you can swim in waves. The circumstances just become harder. And then they're swimming with a snorkel at, say, 20 feet deep which is not a small thing to learn to do. Most, peop most people can't do that. Then there's swimming at 100 feet deep. I'm not going to give you the details of how that's possible. Only crazy people do it. But I've been at 100 feet deep um, with no air tank, with no nothing. You can't stay there very long. <laughs> you, there's just no air. That's much, much harder. I couldn't have done that in the beginning. There are people in the South Seas who do that kind of thing all the time. Um, I didn't do it all the time. I did it, I think, once or twice, and it was on a dare, and it was pretty scary. It's all about progressing. We learn to do more, and at each step, we experience some sense of, oh fear, some sense of unfamiliarity, but it's not the same unfamiliarity. It's not uh, the same feeling of being trapped that we had in the beginning when we couldn't swim at all. Same in emotional stuff. Free, then more freedom is required to dig deeper, like swimming deeper. Then the deeper you go, the more capable you must become to deal with deeper wounds. This is why 
so many people, uh, as they're investigating real love, they feel wonderful. And then they hit their first bump and they fall down and they go, oh, well, I, well, real love doesn't work. No, you just experienced a bump in the road. Uh, and if you got up, you'd discover that you heal much faster and that you're on a steeper slope than you've ever been before. But we, we hate pain so much that we'd rather flee pain than genuinely be happy. Just the lessening of pain becomes our new definition of happy. I was a drug addict for years. That was my definition of happy. When I was unconscious. Yeah, that doesn't qualify as happy. New subject. I know a woman who was in a terrible relationship. It was selfish and unloving. And she came for to see me for a couple of days and learned what it was like to feel loved. Then she went back home to learn to love her husband. She had, because he refused to come and be seen by anybody, he didn't need any of that. And he used some foul word, but I don't remember what it was. He didn't need any of that. She had always demanded from him what she needed. And, and what she learned as I spoke to her was to feel loved enough that she could love him first instead of demanding from him. She said that it was hard. I think it was by email, if I remember. And I said, stop everything. Listen to this slowly. This is the kind of stuff that separates the loving, the loving people, and the living from those who are not loving and living. Um, give you an example. I'm thirsty. So what? I can wait. I can put somebody else's desires before mine for a while and I can drink later. So can you with your husband. Now that you have found a place, in fact, more than one place where you can get loved, um, you don't need to be loved by him every minute of the day. In fact, he's already proven pretty thoroughly after quite a few years of marriage that he can't love you. But you can get love and you can put off getting loved by him. That might be years. But see, you've got a source of water. He doesn't, except for you. Now, this is not advice for a people pleaser or a doormat to love everybody else first. See, the... There's no one answer that fits everybody. I'm talking to somebody who was in a terrible relationship and she was selfish and unloving. Um, a people pleaser or a doormat wouldn't be told to give more because they could only give it in from a victim-y weak place. But for selfish people who are demanding, this is a great suggestion to delay their gratification and learn to be loving. She responded, I can see that. Caring about his happiness above my temporary desire for a beverage. She was referring to my metaphor that I just used. My first experience with feeling what it feels like to put him first. What was it like? Oh, I like it. When I first got back from my time with you, you, you said, even if he doesn't respond to being unconditionally loved, you will be happier. I was so happy being focused on him and discarding any need for him or them, whoever them is, me, other people, to like me or think anything, any particular thing about me. It was so much easier, so much more fun. This is what you meant by freedom, isn't it? Now, notice at the top of this discussion, she said that it was hard to be the one who initially loves. And now she's getting, no, what she did before, constantly selfishly demanding and getting into arguments and fights and being disappointed and critical and controlling, that was hard. 
Now listen to what she's saying. This really is freedom, isn't it? Yes. It's easier to love. In the beginning, yeah, maybe not so much because it's different. But it is easier, much. It's very difficult to explain this to people. The whole experience is so large. This is her speaking. When you told me about my reflexive behaviors, I was scared for a minute about who I was without them. No kidding. If we've been using protective behaviors all of our lives, we get to the point where we believe that those behaviors are who we are. And that's not true. She learned. She gave and gave to him, whether he gave back or not. And her fears decreased and his fears decreased because when she would metaphorically punch him with a demand, well, he'd punch her back. As she became less afraid, so did he. So I loved her. She loved him. He slowly began to learn to love her just a little. And I've talked about this in the books, but I'm going to say it again. He didn't love her back because that's not unconditional love. Then you're doing something in return for something. No, he loved her also. He loved her because, well, loving is a better way to live. Yeah? So everybody was happy. They learned to love each other. The natural flow of love is simply miraculous. New subject. Somebody writes, I've been practicing real love for months and recently... I looked at my own Facebook pages. I was a bit horrified, as most of us would be if we learned about real love and looked at our Facebook pages, or if you have been practicing real love for a long time. Uh, I can't remember when, but somebody wrote me and I wanted to learn something about them. I don't ever go to Facebook, but I did on this one occasion. It must have been years ago. The pictures on Facebook were absolutely nothing like what she was describing about herself. It was complete pretend. Back to this person who, by the way, is writing to me. Um, I looked at my own Facebook pages. I was horrified. Every picture is designed to make me look physically fit, happy, like a good wife and a good mother. And of course, I got hundreds of likes and flattering comments. Well, I'll bet. Facebook is a festival of flattery and comparison, and it's disaster either way. Neither of those will ever make you happy. In fact, they will distract you to the point where you can't be happy. Flattery yields an artificial sense of worth, and comparison simply makes you feel worse about yourself. Because you can always find somebody who looks better, is thinner, has a bigger, apparently happier family. Because I attended a photo shoot once um, where (laughs) it doesn't matter why or when. And the mother of the family was, she would have been a great concentration camp commandant. Um, She barked orders and people moved. And when she barked, hold still and smile. Everybody bloody held still and smiled. And later, uh, by a little bit of tweaking of the photograph and because of her barking orders, she had a picture of her family where everybody looked absolutely happy. And when the photo shoot was over, they went right back to complaining, whining, yelling, demanding, victimy. It, it, It was a nightmare. Facebook portrays those pictures, many of which have been altered. You continue, and I see the comments that I wrote back. It's embarrassing. What an eye-opener. I feel like I was looking at some kind of twisted, sick version of myself. Well, bless you. What an insight. Look back 
looking back at what we did when we were in our pain, we, we can see that we were pretty insane. You continue, one person commented on what a nice picture it was of our family. I had replied something like, that means a lot coming from someone who is as talented with art and photography as yourself. <laughs> now, this is her speaking to me. Yuck. How flattering and insincere can somebody be? And she was describing herself. Which, of course, makes me smile because... As our eyes open, we see more and more. We get deeper and deeper and go, oh, I can't believe I did that. You continue, I was so desperate for people to like me. I had to say things like that to feel good about myself as a person. It gave me a sense of worth. I never want to go back there having to be nice to feel good about myself. I've been so much more happy. I felt so much more, uh, sorry, I've been so much more unhappy. I have felt so much more worthless than I realized. All those years I was unhappy and felt worthless and I didn't know it. And I'm seeing it better and better as I'm becoming happy because I'm seeing the contrast between the two. I'm seeing the distance grow. The old life where I thought I was happy. The new life where I'm genuinely happy. And as I become genuinely happier, this looks worse, even though the past can't get worse. Um, but my view of it gets worse because the distance between what I thought was happy and what is, is becoming huge. Beautiful. And it's because you keep trusting and moving forward, which is amazing. The comment I made, this is you concluding, I don't think I would ever say such a thing now. It would just feel weird. It would feel fake and insincere. And I'm really glad that I can see it now. And so am I. I'm just thrilled for you that you've stayed with it, that you've stuck with it through the pain, that when it was difficult, you just kept climbing. And now you've discovered what you, in your own words, describe as freedom and happiness, or as Donna says, freedom and joy. And that's why we do this. As we bring more love into our lives, that's the reward. Freedom and joy. Not changing other people, although that might happen. It's our own happiness that results always works. We'll see you in a week.